Welcome back to the game collection. It's been a little while since my last review, but I've been hard at work. I've been tackling a game series that's been on my to-do list for quite some time. And in fact, it's not just a game series, but an interconnected franchise that transcends several mediums. And it's a sprawling undertaking in which I decided to immerse myself in order to give me proper context for this review. I am Super Derek, and this is Project Dot Hack. Because they are directly related, in preparation for this review, I decided to watch Dot Hack Sign. The universe of Dot Hack is an alternate timeline taking place in a futuristic 2010. The world suffered a massive attack from a super virus a couple of years prior, known as Pluto's Kiss, which devastated most computers and networks across the globe. The world's internet was locked down to the public after the event in a reactionary move by public leaders. Dot Hack Sign, the anime, started airing in April of 2002, and the games were released between June of 2002 and April of 2003 in Japan. I think it's a safe bet that the event and political climate following the events of 9-11 greatly inspired the political climate following the events of Pluto's Kiss. Tensions are high and people are fearful of cyber terrorism. In much the same way that the series and games were released to a post 9 11 world, the events of the series and games take place in a post Pluto's Kiss world. A few years later, the virtual reality online RPG called The World had just been released to the public, and for the sake of clarification, any further references in this review to The World will be referring to the in game MMO. The World is a huge success selling over 20 million copies worldwide. However, as we gradually learn throughout the anime and the game series, there's something peculiar about the world. Dot Hack Sign follows a loose group of people who are playing the world. Almost the entirety of the anime takes place within the world, with only a brief glimpse of the outside world and hazy, sepia-toned flashbacks. The show tends to linger the longest on Mimiru. She's a sometimes irritating but well-meaning Heavy Blade character and de facto protagonist. In the world, she meets an antisocial and all-around uninterested player named Tsukasa, who mysteriously appears to be incapable of logging out. Mimiru and her friends make it their mission to solve the mystery and help Tsukasa. However, other power-tripping players are seeking to bring Tsukasa to justice for his disrespect and ignoring their guild's authority. A point of interest for the anime is that while it may appear on the surface to take place in a typical fantasy world, it actually takes place in a typical fantasy game inside of a science fiction universe. As such, the characters are actually players who log in and out of the game, have persona that they put on during the game and take off as they leave. People tend to keep their personal lives distant despite being good comrades within the world. It's an interesting dynamic that for the longest time was completely unique to Dot Hack. This setup and this RPG world would seem ripe for epic battles, unique monsters, and interesting dungeons, but that's not what the show is about. Instead, the anime frequents the subject of those interplayer personal politics and online social dynamics which are sometimes interesting conceptually, but about as action-packed as C-SPAN. Dot Hack is supposed to be a thinking person's show, thought-provoking, a slow burn. If you want an action comedy harem anime, you're better off sticking with Sword Art Online. But if a slow, methodic pace is more your style and you're cool with long stints of introspection between events occurring, this might be up your alley. But almost in direct contradiction to that is the fast and loose way in which the Dot Hack universe handles apparent paradoxes of metaphysics and the nature of consciousness. It almost feels like the anime is deliberately obfuscating why and how things are happening by invoking a layer of contrived lore. Trust me, the irony of a JRPG reviewer pointing this out is not lost on me. I can't say a whole lot about it without giving away spoilers, so instead allow me to say just this. If you want to be taken seriously as science fiction, you can't just wave a magic wand to explain away giant gaping plot holes. 
Sad to say, but the show didn't hold my attention very well, at least until the last handful of episodes. The pacing of the show is perhaps its weakest point. Each episode feels slow, but each episode ends with a cliffhanger. The pacing of the overarching plot is the exact same as well. Very, very slow ramp up which eventually spikes at the end during the climax, a pattern which we'll unfortunately continue to see repeated several times throughout the game series. What I think the anime did successfully though is world building, pun intended. The world is an interesting concept. Sure, it may be generic fantasy with a backstory far more complicated than was called for, but I think that was kind of the point. The world isn't supposed to take center stage unlike similar shows. It's a generic fantasy RPG backdrop that conceals the fact that the anime is about people talking to each other behind keyboards and VR headsets. The show's story is overall a bit weak, but the anime sets up the stage well for future installments of the franchise, which I am positive was one of its primary purposes. With the anime series covered, I was ready to tackle Dot Hack Infection. Dot Hack Infection was released in the middle of the original run of Dot Hack Sign. Over the course of the next year, three more titles were released Mutation, Outbreak, and Quarantine. As I made my way through the series of games, it became clear to me that each game was not actually its own self-contained game, but rather a continuation of the same story across four retail releases. Final Fantasy VII is a game spread across three discs on the PlayStation 1, but it was sold in a single case for a one-time purchase price. Imagine if Final Fantasy VII was instead split across four discs, and each disc was sold to you separately over the course of a year. And after each disc, you were shown the credits and created a save file. I mean, could you imagine if Final Fantasy VII was parted out and sold to us piece by piece today? I like to think that if a company tried to do that today, people would riot in the streets. Oh. Or not, I guess. The Dot Hack games take place a short while after the events of Sign. It follows a mostly different cast of characters led by Kite, a player whose friend is knocked into a coma after being destroyed by a corrupted enemy in the world. A mysterious girl entrusts Kite with the powerful bracelet which grants Kite the unique ability to combat these so-called data bugs on equal footing. But several players are still comatose and CC Corporation and the game admins are suspiciously tight-lipped about the entire matter. Taking matters into his own hands, Kite teams up with a fellow newbie Black Rose and a large cast of friends in order to get to the bottom of things. The plot of Dot Hack Infection moves far more quickly than Sign, and it finds a way to quickly get Kite invested in the events of the world, which is more than I could say about Mimiru of Sign. The motivations of Black Rose aren't immediately clear, but are gradually revealed throughout the rest of the game, making the lead characters loads more relatable. But character development is still very slow and handled in a unique way that, honestly, isn't great. The cast of characters are mostly developed through the odd cutscene during character-specific side quests and during email communications between players. In between play sessions in the world, you have access to the news website, which dispenses lore consisting of in-game current events, and your email client, which you can use to read email from your online friends and send one of two pre-composed responses. I found most of the players to be pretty two-dimensional overall. The players you meet in the world often roleplay and don't break out of that very much even through email, and since most of the players didn't give their own characters very much depth, you'll be hard-pressed to find redeeming qualities in the more annoying players. Was quite refreshing. You may take the plunder. Black Rose is probably the only character who changes at all over the course of the game, and I'm not sure if that really counts since it's kind of a requirement to fulfill that token Sundere archetype she's filling in. What? What is it? You got something to say? Upon logging into the world, you have access to the board, which is a forum where people dispense other bits of lore and talk about the game. Generally, when you have nothing left to do in the world, you need to log out and check your news, email, or the board in order to trigger an event, which then allows the story to continue. This is because in the Dot .hack games, you're not really playing as Kite, you're playing as the middle school kid who's logging into the world as Kite. Again, an interesting dynamic that was, for the longest time, unique to Dot .hack. That said, as I alluded to earlier, the games have a big problem with pacing where nothing seems to happen until the end of each game. There are plenty of things to do in the world as long as you don't mind repetition. Most quests follow the following formula. 1. Find a set of keywords on the forum or email. 2. 
Use the chaos gate to enter the area using those keywords. 3. Find and enter the dungeon, make your way down 2 to 5 floors, and find the room that triggers the event or boss battle. 4. Defeat the boss if necessary, then warp out and repeat. Each game has somewhere in the ballpark of 30 to 40 of these such quests. In some special storyline specific quests of the game, you can get a cutscene or two that thickens the plot or deliver character backstory. One of the reasons that I started reviewing games in the first place was to force myself to start playing and beating different games. And honestly, if it weren't for you guys as my external motivation, I may not have been able to make it through the second disc. But then, something happened. About halfway through the third game, something clicked. I was having fun. Maybe it was the grunty racing that finally got me out of my own head, but what I think actually did it was that I learned I was trying to play it like a hack and slash action RPG, mashing the attack button, choosing the occasional spell, letting my team members self-manage, and expecting to get stronger after equipping new weapons and armor and leveling up. Basically, I went in playing dot hack like it was supposed to be Kingdom Hearts, but instead what I ended up playing was something completely different. In Secret of Mana, the winning strategy 90% of the time is to exploit the magic system. You locate the enemy weakness, you bring up a menu, and you cast a spell, wait for that animation to finish, then you cast the spell again before the damage counter even shows up. You're locking the enemy in place, making them unable to attack because they're too busy getting hit to even move. It's a cheap strategy, but it works really, really well. But suppose someone made a game where that wasn't just a strategy to exploit, but it's what the game was actually balanced for the player to do. That would be dot .hack. Micromanaging is the name of the game. In dot .hack, characters don't learn spells, the equipment that they have equipped determines what spells they have available. The weapons and armor equipped don't only affect the usual stats though. Equipping a weapon might grant you some extra physical attack power, but it could also decrease your accuracy and fire resistance, increase your magical defense stat, and help prevent confusion while giving you a couple of extra combos. This affects every piece of armor too. Add on inventory restrictions and additional characters to manage and things can quickly quickly become quite tedious. Once I realized this, the game became far easier and far more fun to play. You'll find a good amount of your battles take place buried several layers deep in your menu system. It's a deep and complex system you can really dive deep into if the menu navigation doesn't turn you off. Battles were eventually where I found my solace during my 88 hour playthrough. One of the strongest enemies you'll fight constantly throughout the game is the game's camera. In order to target enemies with skills and spells, you have to be able to see the enemy on your TV, regardless of how near or far that enemy might be to you. The third person follow cam swings at a slow cinematic pace though, which is nice for making trailers, but it can take what feels like forever to see what's right behind you. One of the more interesting aspects of the battle system is the introduction of our hero's unique ability called Data Drain. When an enemy has been beaten senseless, it may enter a stunned state called Protect Break, which makes them susceptible to Data Drain. When Data Drain is used, the enemy is transformed into a helpless weakling that is easily dispatched. During the Data Drain process, you acquire an item from the enemy, usually a piece of equipment, and sometimes you get a virus core. More on those later. One of the most consistent ways to upgrade your equipment is to Data Drain enemies for their drops. Extra equipment can be given to your allies or sold off to shops, and is a great way to rack up cash. Data Drain also has one more important use in fighting boss battles. Most bosses and some regular enemies are infected with corrupted data, which in turn makes those enemies invincible. The only way to defeat most bosses is to knock them senseless until they are susceptible to Data Drain. Once drained, the boss or enemy will be susceptible to damage and can be easily dispatched. Generally, the most difficult part of any of the boss battles is getting him to that stunned state, but after that point, it's all downhill. Leveling in Dot Hack is a unique system that conceptually is very clever. Players in Dot Hack level up every 1000 experience points no matter what level they are. What does change between levels is the amount of experience points that an enemy rewards when defeated. The amount is calculated based on a difference between the enemy and character's levels with a maximum of 522 points. This means that players that are newly added to your crew can rapidly level up to your exact level within just an hour of grinding. Once your level is above your enemies though, experience points rapidly drop off to a single point. 
This would normally be acceptable to me though if it weren't for the fact that a few levels of difference between enemies and characters doesn't really amount to much of a stat difference. I've been on the brink of defeat to enemies that would yield only a single point on more than one occasion. I'm a firm believer that if something is difficult in a game, there should be some sort of reward or payoff to ensure proper balance. This system, while clever, fell short in its execution. The world in the Dot .hack games is a far cry from the diversity and dungeon design promised in the anime. Server towns are lifted directly from the anime, but are far smaller than you might expect, and offer far less to do than you might hope. The NPCs in these towns are other players, of course, who are just enjoying the game themselves, so there's nobody in the towns to offer you side quests or anything like that. No houses to break into, to steal from, none of the typical stuff you'd like to do in a JRPG. However, like an MMO, you can try trading with other players to get better equipment, should you feel like it. The areas with the dungeons are procedurally generated and are based on the keywords entered. The area might be daytime or nighttime, the area will have different elemental attributes, and may even have different structures haphazardly placed that are thematically linked to those elemental attributes. At least, that is, while you're outside. However, you don't really want to be on the outside because everything happens on the inside. Every objective is always at the bottom of the dungeon, making the outside area feel unique but underutilized. Once inside the dungeon though, you quickly find yourself in procedurally generated dungeons composed of large rooms and hallways. There's a handful of types of dungeons and various palette swaps of each, which again is determined by those keywords. There aren't anything like puzzles to figure out to proceed, it's just a matter of getting from point A to point B without dying while being forced to fight every enemy placed in your path. To be blunt, these dungeons and design choices reek of Tartarus design from Persona 3. Some areas in the world are protected zones that are locked down by the administrators of the world to prevent players from carelessly wandering into corrupted areas. Remember when I mentioned that enemies sometimes drop virus cores when defeated? Those virus cores are lettered A through Z and are used to hack through the protection on these areas. This is called gate hacking and it can take up to three each of four different lettered virus cores. This is a pretty neat idea, but it feels like a cleverly disguised fetch quest if you don't have the cores required. This can mean grinding against weaker enemies for random drops, trying not to kill them before you can stun them and data drain them. Too much of this can bring your fun to a quick halt though, so be sure to keep a surplus of virus cores of each type around to save yourself headaches down the road. While collecting for this series, I recommend going for complete copies because each copy of the game was sold with two discs. One disc is the game and the other is an episode of the OVA Dot Hack Liminality. For the uninitiated, OVA is short for Original Video Animation, what that essentially means that these are episodes of an anime that went direct to DVD. Typically OVAs have a larger budget per episode and push boundaries that can't be shown on television, but in the case of Liminality they were just packed in with the games because they tie directly into the games. The OVA follows the XCC Corporation employee Mr. Tokuoka and his investigation into the comatose players of the world. Gradually, he builds an alliance with Mai, Yuki, and Kyo who assist him in his attempts to find out what CC Corp is hiding and how to wake up those victims. Dot Hack Liminality ties directly into the events of the game, but they don't really interact until the last few hours of the game itself. Up until that point, the series seems mostly supplemental to the games, offering unique insights into the universe of Dot Hack and giving us more information about the origin of the Epitaph of Twilight and the designer of the world. Liminality is also unique among the Dot .hack franchise in that it provides us with a rare view into the world outside of the world, and this extended view shows us that their world isn't really too far removed from our own. The entire series lasts just over a couple of hours long, but manages to be some of the most entertaining few hours of the Dot .hack series. However, episode 3 of the series acts as a deep dive into the lore of the Epitaph of Twilight and the designer behind Fragment, the game that the world was based on. This episode was particularly difficult to enjoy just because of how heavy it was with dialogue. It was only a half an hour long, but the dry material made it feel like an hour. Aside from episode 3 though, I have to say I quite enjoyed the OVAs. Things moved at a nice brisk pace and had more than a couple of action sequences to shake things up. 
Dot Hack Sign is 26 episodes long, and I honestly found it a chore to power through. It's difficult to recommend to anyone who's not already a fan of the Dot Hack series. Aside from the soundtrack, which is great, and the world that it helps develop, I don't think that it offers anything that couldn't be better delivered by better, newer anime such as Log Horizon. This show is currently able to be streamed in its entirety on Hulu. The Dot Hack games are also a bit of a difficult sale. The first title is inexpensive and plentiful, and can be had for less than $20, but each game is rarer and pricier, ending with the fourth game which is difficult to find and costs $120. And while the final game of the series delivers a satisfying ending, and I did eventually find myself enjoying the series, it took over 50 hours for me to get to that point. Of course, incomplete copies are going to be quite a bit cheaper, but you're likely to miss out on the liminality DVDs that help make sense of the confusing events throughout the game. And as one of the best parts of the entire series, I don't think I could really consider these optional. So with everything I just said, what can I recommend that you do? Let's start with Dot Hex Sign. I'd say it's not really a prerequisite to enjoy the games. If the idea and concept of the trapped in a game world genre appeal to you, there's no shortage of anime available to you to scratch that itch. I think the anime should only be watched by people who are already a fan of the series. The games, on the other hand, are kind of tricky. I won't tell you that they're all worth it. Instead, buy Infection and try it out. It's cheap enough that it's not a bad wager. The game doesn't change much, if at all, from game to game, so if you've played Infection and want to know what happens next, buy the next one, and so on. If after the third game you still haven't lost interest, then buy Quarantine, and I'm glad that you enjoyed the series. Watch each DVD as you complete the game, but what I recommend that you don't do is exactly what I did. In retrospect, I think I accidentally sabotaged myself by trying to force myself into a game series that didn't initially speak to me. I initially went in and watched the anime, hoping that it would get me pumped to play the games, and it kind of had the opposite effect. Then I played the first game and didn't really dig it, but I kept plugging away because I had just spent $200 on the complete set, and that just set me up for a bad time. So with such an undertaking of this size, I recommend that you pace yourself. Take your time. Don't force yourself into the games like I did, and I think that with the right expectations, at least one of these games would be a fine addition to your game collection. Thanks for sticking with me guys through that long review, that was a long time coming, and um, I think we should be back to a normal schedule here soon. I did just launch a new website, SuperDerekRPGs.com, where you can find the status of the next video, as well as a spot where you can vote on games that you'd like me to review or not review. And uh, also, I'd like to spend a uh, special thank you to Sean Johnson, a new patron of mine over on Patreon.com. If you want to become a patron, be sure to head over there and check it out at uh, SuperDerek <laughs> at Patreon.com slash SuperDerek. Thanks, guys.